Welcome to this lesson on one of the foundational concepts of the GMAT quantitative section, number properties. So let's begin by just considering some different definitions that we'll encounter on the exam. So an integer is one of the primary definitions you'll need to know. And for the purposes of this exam, an integer is just a numeric value with only zeros after a decimal point. So 10.2 would be a non-integer, two thirds non-integer. And in most practical forms on the exam, if you see the term integer, you can just think to yourself, there are no fractions allowed for this problem. Now, a divisor or a factor is another concept that is generally applied to integers, but it technically is a number that divides into another number evenly. So it could technically involve a fraction, say one fourth would be a divisor or factor of one half because you'd have one half divided by two would give you one quarter. But 97 times out of 100, this is going to be a concept applied to integers. So let's just consider divisors and factors in relationship to an integer, such as, say, 12. So four would be a divisor or factor of 12 because four goes into 12 exactly three times. So that's how you can consider a factor is it will evenly go into the number you're testing. A multiple, however, is a number that multiplies from another number. So again, using the value of 12 as our exemplar, 24 would be a multiple of 12. And generally the way to think about this in the most simplistic of terms is that factors or divisors are less than or equal to the number that you're testing and multiples are greater than or equal to the number that you're testing. And there's one overarching rule that you can apply to all factors and multiples, which is that your largest factor is going to be equal to the smallest number, uh, smallest multiple, which is equal to the number itself. So the largest factor of 12 is 12 itself. The smallest multiple of 12 is 12 itself. And of course, 12 is 12 itself because 12 times one, 12, 12 divided by one, 12. So that's just one of those overarching concepts that can come up in creative ways on the exam. Now, let's just define the terms pertaining to our four basic arithmetic functions. If you're dealing with addition, the result of addition is a sum. If you're looking at subtraction, the result of subtraction is a difference. The product is going to be your result of multiplication and a quotient is your result of division. There isn't really much more to say about these terms as they're defined, but you just have to recognize that if the problem is asking about a product or a difference, that product means multiply, difference means subtract. So now let's talk about evens and odds because this is a concept that the exam really likes to leverage. So an even integer technically is just going to be an integer that is divisible by two. An odd integer is going to be an integer not divisible by two. Math is often defined by what isn't true as much as what is. So an odd integer is not every multiple of three, for instance, because six is a multiple of three, but it's also a multiple of two. So six would be even, not odd. So just recognize odd technically means not divisible by two. Now, zero technically is even because if you divide zero by two, you have no remainder. So therefore, technically zero is even. Now, when you compute evens and odds using your four basic functions, there are just some rules that you can commit to memory that will simplify evaluation of data sufficiency and problem solving questions involving evens and odds. First, only a sum or difference of an odd and an even is odd. So three plus two is odd. Three plus two is five, it's odd. That's the only way to get an odd is either three plus two, odd plus an even, gives you five or three minus two, which would give you one, which again is not. However, the sum or difference of two even values is even. So if I take four plus two, it remains even, it becomes six. Four minus two becomes two, remains even. Same thing with two odds, because you lose the leftover basically. So if I did three plus one, it becomes even. Three minus one becomes two, it's even. Then when we talk about products, the product of two evens remains even. So as soon as you introduce a factor of two, it's going to remain an even throughout all of the multiples as well. So two times four, eight stays even. Two odds, however, their product will remain odd. So if I've got five times three, that's 15, still odd. The only way to produce an even is to introduce an even factor. So the product of an odd and an even will become even say like the aforementioned three and two, three times two becomes six. And as soon as you introduce that factor of two, 
it becomes even. Now, there are no consistent rules defined for quotients because you may not even in, uh, end up with an actual integer. And for that reason, quotients aren't usually tested for odds and evens in this same way. Now, let's talk about some specific integer values that have very unique properties, starting with the value of 1. Because the product of any value in 1 is itself. So 2 times 1, 1. x times 1, x. So any value times 1, whether it's a known value or a variable, is just itself. The quotient of any value other than 0 divided by 1 is itself. <clears throat> so if you divide, say, 2 by 1, it stays 2. x divided by 1 stays uh, x. So again, if you are looking at an integer, it technically has a tacit denominator of 1 and a tacit multiplier of 1. It's just the nature of arithmetic. Now, the quotient of any value divided by other than 0 divided by itself is also 1. So again, 12 divided by 1 is going to be, uh, or sorry, 12 divided by 12 is going to be 1. x divided by x is going to be 1. And the implicit exponential value of any number is also 1. So if you're just looking, say, 2 on the screen, you're looking at 2 to the first power. Now, 0 also has a lot of special properties. So it is the only non-negative and non-positive value. So what that means is that 0 is not negative, it's not positive, because 0 itself is what defines positives and negatives. Anything greater than 0 is positive, anything less than 0 is negative. And when you add or subtract 0 from any value, you have no change to the value. So that means if I've got 3 plus 0, remains 3. 3 minus 0 remains 3. The product of any value in 0 is just 0. So if you have 25 times 0, you get 0. If you have x times 0, it stays 0. But you cannot divide by 0 because your result is actually non-real. Your technical result, if you divide an integer or any other numeric or variable value by 0, is infinity. And that is a non-real value because it cannot be expressed on the number line. And therefore, the exam doesn't really test it. Because for the purposes of GMAT division, dividing by 0 is not defined. They don't use infinity. They don't use non-real values. So... You just got to know, especially pertaining to data sufficiencies and some of the more difficult data sufficiencies that might test this concept, that you cannot define by zero or uh, divide by zero on this exam. Now, absolute value is technically the distance from zero on the number line. And because of that, absolute value is always greater than or equal to zero because you cannot have a negative distance. So the absolute value symbol is just the vertical lines and those vertical lines around negative 4 would be 4 because negative 4 is 4 units from 0 on the number line. So you can always consider absolute value conceptually as the distance from 0 on the number line if there is no second value within the absolute value symbol. Now, as I mentioned, pertaining to the GMAT, all GMAT math is real. And you can see a bunch of real values, albeit irrational values, on this sample number line with zero in the center. So, just defining real numbers. They are any values that can be expressed on that number line with zero as the central point. Now, rational numbers are numbers that can be expressed as fractions, so things like one-half or one-third. Because I know that one-half is exactly... Uh, the exact central point of 0 and 1. One third would be splitting 0 and 1 into equal thirds. So that's what a rational number is. Even if it cannot be expressed as a terminating decimal, it is rational because it can be expressed as a fraction. Now, irrational numbers cannot be expressed as fractions. You can see these on uh, as examples on the number line that we have here. So things like negative one-half pi or pi or the square root of two are non-rational uh, or irrational values because you can't say it's a fraction. It's a more complex value. I mean, there's still somewhere some Swiss mathematicians figuring out all of the decimal points far beyond pi. So far, far beyond, beyond the three in pi. So these are things that just cannot be expressed as fractions, but we have some basic structures around which we can place them on the number line. And you only want to convert irrational numbers to the decimal system if you are being asked to approximate. Otherwise, there's going to be more savvy ways to place and compare irrational values. So, for instance, 
pi square root of 2 square root of 3 because of geometry these are probably the only ones that you want to have committed to memory pi of course is going to be 3.14 the square root of 2 is 1.4 roughly and the square root of 3 is 1.7 roughly again if you know more than that like you know that the square root of 2 is actually 1.41 that's great square root of 3 1.73 great but simplify even more so just to make the mental arithmetic uh easier as necessary but only do so if you're being asked to approximate and also recognize that if you are familiar with the saints days in the united states the square root of two and the square root of three can be memorized by remembering saint patrick's day and saint uh saint valentine's day because 214 in the american month day convention is February 14th or St. Va uh, Valentine's Day and square root of three at 1.7 would be St. Patrick's Day or March 17th so just a nice little mnemonic device you can use there and if you're going to try to compare irrational values to rational values you want to convert them on the number line and that's why we've just highlighted the square root of 17 up here you may be thinking to yourself, how am I supposed to know what the square root of 17 is approximately? Well, I don't. It's relatively difficult to come up with, and it, again, is an irrational number. It cannot be terminated as a decimal and or uh, represented as a fraction. But there is what is known as a perfect square very nearby, and that would be the square root of 16. Because the square root of 16 is going to allow conversion to a rational decimal integer based value of four so i know that the square root of 17 here has to be just a little bit bigger than the square root of 16 or four so that allows us to place the square root of 17 on the number line confidently so those are some of the basics around number properties let's go on to the whiteboard and take a look at some example problems together so let's begin by just taking a look at an irrational number style question for problem solving. Now, as always, we'll set up our scratch pad to begin. And so, whoops, let's go ahead and grab our answer choices here. A, B, C, D, E. Put a little line over top. Let's see what we're looking for. And we're looking for furthest from zero on that number line and you may or may not write out the values on the exam for your own usage but we see that all of our answer choices are using irrational radical not notation and when that's the case it's a big neon sign that says do not translate this into an integer or decimal format Instead, we want to savvily evaluate things by basically getting out of the irrational format and using some more common values that we would recognize on the number line. So the way that we're going to do that is we're basically going to square all the values to simplify the evaluation. Because we know if we square a square root, we just get the value underneath it. So we'll just kind of put a big parentheses here and test these out and eliminate as we go. Because once it gets bigger, we know that we're further from zero. And if we've got a value that's smaller than something, then we end up change, uh, eliminating it. So if we square 2 times the square root of 10, we're going to end up with 4 times 10, which is equal to 40. Okay, so there's our baseline. Then if we've got 3 times the square root of 8 and square that, we've got 9 times 8, which is 72. So that means we can immediately eliminate choice A because 72, of course, is further from 0 than 40. Then we've got 16 times 5, which is going to give us 80. And now 80 is greater than or further away from 0 than 72, so goodbye to B. Then we've got 25, because we square the 5, times 3, which is going to give us 75. 75 is, of course, less than that 80 value in choice C. And then we square 6 to get 36 times 2, and we get the exact same value as choice B of 72, and can confidently select choice C as being the value of these, or the irrational value 
listed in the choices that is furthest from zero on the number line. So now let's scroll on down and we'll take a look at how this would apply to a data sufficiency problem. So as always, we have to start with what we know. And so in this case, we've got Y minus Z and we want to know, is that even? Question mark, we put our little Y slash N there, box that off so that we never lose sight of what we're being asked about. Now, we know that we had those list of rules, right? Even minus even is going to produce an even. We know that an even minus an odd is going to produce an odd. And we know that an odd minus an odd is going to produce an even because the remainder of one, when you have an odd divided by two, goes away if you subtract the odd by an odd. So what we need is going to be to, to determine if y and z are the same even versus odd. Because if they're both evens, then y minus z is even. If they're both odds, then y minus z is even. But if one's an even and one's an odd, the answer is always no. So condition one says that y plus one is less than zero. So this just tells me that y is negative. So y is less than negative one to be exact. But does that tell us anything about whether y is even or odd? Not at all. So that's going to allow us to say this by itself, not sufficient. Our options are going to, of course, be B, C, E at that point. Now, condition two says that Z minus two is less than zero. So that means that Z is less than negative two. Or sorry, positive two. But by itself, that doesn't even tell me if Z is positive or negative. So that alone is not sufficient. So we can eliminate choice B because that would mean that condition two alone is sufficient to determine always an answer. And when we combine the two, we still never know whether Z and Y are even or odd. So if Y were to equal, say, uh, just got to be less than negative one, negative two, and Z were to say equal one, then negative two minus one would be three. And the answer to the question would be, well, it's odd. But if y were to be, say, negative 2 and z were to be just 0, well, now it's an even. And so we get both outcomes. We can plug in with yes, no's a little bit more re uh, readily. But even with both conditions, we never determine whether y minus z is even. We just determine, and honestly, we don't determine much even about even um, negative versus positive necessarily. But we eliminate choice C and we select E because... At no point do we get enough of information to determine always if the answer is yes or no to that question of is y minus z even. So go ahead and apply some of these concepts around number properties in your own continued practice through data sufficiency and problem solving questions as you get ready to take your own GMAT exam in the future.